Well, good afternoon, everyone. It seems uh, somewhat surreal being back in the building after uh, the election period. It's been so long of campaigning, I'm kind of like, what do we do now? <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, uh, I'm actually, I actually just thought I would start off just talking a little bit about the campaign. You know, I think uh, for us as the Conservative Party of British Columbia, um, it was, uh, you know, quite a major accomplishment. A year and a half ago, uh, we had, what, 2% in the polls and no MLAs. And so then I joined the party um, in February of 2023. We went through, Bruce Bamman joined us in September of 2023, giving us official party status. And from there, we continue to grow support across the province, uh, culminating now in the largest number of Conservatives elected in British Columbia's history. Certainly the first time that there has been a Conservative elected in the legislature since 1978. Some of the other accomplishments we did as the Conservative Party is we actually have the first black woman who has been um, elected since 1972. Uh, we have 41% uh, of our MLAs elected are women. Um, about 22% or so of our MLAs are ethnic minorities. It's quite an accomplishment uh, for our party and I'm very proud of the team that uh, has been elected and put together. I think, quite frankly, uh, when you look at what's across the province, too, and the desire for change in the province, I think the voters have spoke very, very, cloudly, very loudly in terms of what their expectations are for this government, uh, as well as for us as opposition. Our job now going forward, uh, clearly, I mean, there's still um, some questions to be answered in terms of the uh, judicial reviews, but our job going forward uh, in opposition is to make sure uh, that we fight for the values and fight for the things that the Conservative Party stands for those things that uh, we've been fought, fight, fought, fought for for the last uh, year and a half, those things that we fought for during the election, those are the things that we are going to be pushing for in the legislature to try to move forward. Should the NDP decide they want to uh, push forward any part of their agenda that uh, uh, relates to what we're trying to achieve, uh, they'll find us as a partner. If they're going to continue on with their pace, uh, with the destruction that they have wreaked upon this province, uh, with their previous seven years, they'll find us uh, vehemently opposed uh, in terms of how we will function within the legislature. In particular, when I think about our resource sector, there is a lot that needs to be done there, especially for forestry. Forestry it right now is on its knees. It has been, uh, it has been systematically attacked by this NDP government. Uh, we have a deadline of next, Feb next August where uh, the duties are anticipated to uh, increase by about 40 percent, which would shut down virtually all of the forest sector in this province if that carries forward and we're not in a situation where the prices are better. This government needs to understand that our resource sector is a critical component of what we need to achieve in this province, supporting families, supporting jobs, supporting communities, and quite frankly, supporting the revenues that are needed in British Columbia. We'll also be making sure that we push David Eby very hard on things like uh, involuntary compassionate treatment. It's a big piece for us that we pushed in the campaign. Uh, David Eby flipped and flopped on that issue. We're going to make sure we hold him to that and we make sure we get that in place. Our streets need to be cleaned up. We need to be changing what's happening on our streets with drugs. Um, and so that's a big push that we will have uh, with David Eby in terms of his government and holding him accountable. We're also going to hold him to his word in terms of getting rid of the consumer carbon tax. We're going to be pushing to get rid of the entire carbon tax, uh, but that's something that he had promised to do, and we have full expectations that he will do that. Um, we will push um, and try to figure out how we can uh, leverage that to get rid of the entire carbon tax in British Columbia, but it's an important piece of affordability that's needed in British Columbia. There's many other promises that David Eby has made throughout the campaign. Um, and uh, as well as uh, the things that have been promised in the past. And I look forward to the opportunity in the legislature to hold him to account for all of these promises and make sure that uh, he's living up to the things that he has said he would do for the people in this province. So with that, um, I look, very much look forward to uh, our caucus will be sworn in on the night of uh, uh, November 12th. And we'll have an opportunity then to have a little bit of a ceremony uh, associated with that. And we look forward to the work uh, that uh, may come as early as this fall, fall if, the, uh, if they call back the legislature, certainly if not, then by next spring. So I'm happy to take any questions that anybody might have. We're going to one question, one follow-up. Let's go ahead. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, election night, um, John, you said that if the NDP came back in a minority, you'd bring them down at the first opportunity. They've got a scant majority now, but it, it, you're, 
that general kind of attitude, does that still prevail, or is there a bit of room for uh, cooperation here? So the only thing that we would be doing uh, in terms of looking at supporting um, David Eby and his government is if they're moving forward uh, an agenda that matches with the things that we want to accomplish for the people in British Columbia. We will always put the people of British Columbia first, as we did throughout the entire campaign. The average everyday working person in this province, if there are things that are moved forward that, uh, that will improve those lives for those people, we would be looking at supporting it. But if he's going to carry forward with the destructive policies that he has, then yes, we're going to look at every opportunity possible to bring him down as soon as possible. And I, I guess the, the Premier said they're going to recall the legislature in the next few weeks, a very brief sitting. I, the first face-off that you will have, I guess they have to, uh, we need a speaker. Uh, would you nominate someone for a speaker? Or, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, so I do know that um, the NDP have been calling around uh, our members, uh, asking and, and looking for somebody to become a speaker uh, for them. Uh, it's not something that certainly uh, I'm considering supporting at this stage. Uh, if David Eby wanted to call me and say that he wants to move forward with significant parts of our agenda, maybe there's something that we could be talking about. But at this stage, um, you know, I would, I would not be looking at one of our, offering one of our members to be speaker to support the agenda that he ran on. Uh, Hi. What are your thoughts then on the grocery rebate? Would you support that? The grocery rebate? This would be $1,000 per household that David Eby offered up as part of their platform. Uh, it certainly would help people that are struggling with affordability right now. Do you support that? Would you vote for it? So as I said, as a Conservative Party, anything that will help the average everyday uh, hardworking person in this province is something that we would certainly look at supporting. Obviously that's a discussion that we'll have to have in caucus depending on whether that's a piece of legislation that David Eby brings forward this, this fall. And speaking of caucus, have you met with your caucus formally and will you, what have you said to them or what are you planning to say about three votes? So I have met uh, with them. We had our, our first caucus meeting uh, last week. Um, and uh, certainly we'll have an opportunity to be talking again in the future. But as I've said uh, all the way through this campaign, I'm expecting our MLAs to do the job of representing their riding, to make sure they speak on behalf of their riding. And so uh, from that perspective, uh, there will be opportunities for them to be able to voice their perspective in the legislature. Richard? Uh, there are still uh, some supporters of yours out on social media questioning the results of this election saying that uh, elections BC did not handle this well, describe this as rigged. What message do you send uh, to your supporters who are spreading this information? <coughs> well, we put out a statement last night uh, with regards to, uh, to this election and the election BC process. Uh, we accept the results of election BC. We want to thank the, uh, the people in election BC. I know the people working there uh, worked hard to try to uh, achieve the uh, um, the counting and the process that needs to be needed to be done. So I want to thank them for that. But as the Conservative Party of British Columbia, we accept these results and we look forward to the work that we have in front of us. But what do you say to people who continue to spread this information through social media? Like what would you say directly to that? People have the right to say what they're going to say from a Conservative Party perspective. From my perspective, we accept the results that have been uh, presented to us from Elections BC. Certainly not the results that I want to see. Um, we were optimistic and hopeful that we would have an opportunity to be able to uh, bring about the significant change that we are looking for from our, from our, um, our you know, throughout our platform, throughout the uh, mandate. But unfortunately, we fell just short of being able to do that. Well, uh, John, I'm wondering, have you had any conversations with the Green Senators? And I was, was critical of some of your candidates last week. Uh, I'm wondering, the dynamics have shifted a bit with yesterday's results, but have you had any discussions about a partnership with them? No, so I'd, I had done just one conversation with Sonia last week. Uh, Mench talked about uh, uh, what we could potentially be doing and what, what we could potentially work on together. Uh, of course, we said that you know that would be pending the results, but I have not had an opportunity to talk to her since the results have been done. By way of follow up, you indicated if I understood you correctly, you would not encourage any of your candidates to accept an offer to you know be Speaker of the House. But you know that some of them have been contacted. Are you worried that you might lose a, uh, an MLA to? Either crossing the floor or being lured to become the Speaker of the House? Uh, I'm not uh, too worried. I mean, from the caucus uh, meeting we had, people are pretty uh, uh, upbeat and optimistic uh, about the work. They are very proud 
of uh, getting elected, uh, being part of the conservative movement that has been created in this province. I mean, it has been, you know, really since the 1930s, since there was any sizable amount of, of conservative caucus in the legislature. And so uh, they're part of making that history in British Columbia, and I think they're very proud of it, and certainly I'm proud of all of them. Charlie? Uh, circling back to three votes, you said that, uh, you know, you've long promised that uh, candidates and MLAs would be people in the riding before the party. Uh, just wondering if that will carry on into the legislature and how much lease will MLAs have when it comes to expressing their free vote in the legislature? Well, certainly there's, uh, I mean, there's standards and values that we have as a Conservative Party of British Columbia, uh, but one of those is that people's number one priority will be to represent their riding. And so we'll uphold those standards. Yeah, by way of a follow up, in terms of you know shared policies, you said that you work with the NDP. If there's something that they bring forward that you believe is also needed, uh, what are some of those ideas in terms of public safety, affordability? Those are things that uh, David Eby has mentioned. Do you see room to work with the NDP on some of those priorities? Well, it's, it's interesting that David Eby's talked about uh, public safety, uh, given that has certainly not been a priority of his government uh, with the runaway crime that we have seen in British Columbia. Uh, if he is interested in pushing the federal government for things like uh, guaranteed minimum sentencing and bail reform, those are things that I would I'd be supporting to do. Uh, if he wanted to bring additional judges uh, to the, uh, to, into the system and uh, create a, uh, a, an avenue for being able to take these prolific offenders off the street and get them through the criminal system as fast as possible, that's certainly something I would be supporting should they move forward with doing this type of an approach. <clears throat> when it comes to uh, uh, doing anything that is going to help the average everyday person in this province, like getting rid of the carbon tax, those are the sort of things that I would be more than interested in supporting. Sure. <clears throat> Since the election, I'm wondering what your mood is. Are you still looking for blood, or are you looking to maybe be a bit of collaborator? Uh, I can say that, uh, uh, like I say, coming out of the election, uh, I'm very excited about what we've achieved. I'm very excited about who we are as the Conservative Party in British Columbia. I and mean, we have done something that nobody has done in Canadian history in such a short period of time. And so I, I'm very proud of that and very proud of the work that uh, I know that we are going to have in front of us. So I come out of this election uh, disappointed that we didn't form government, but optimistic in terms of the work that we have to do, and uh, very much actually looking forward to getting at it and holding this government account. Great. And um, I'm just think, thinking, how can you actually even be talking to the Greens if you guys are so opposite? They, they, don't, they want the carbon tax, you don't want the carbon tax, you want LNG or resource things to continue, they, they, they say don't do it anymore. How, how can you even be talking to them? Well, uh, you know, there is places, always places where people from different perspectives have an opportunity to find common ground. And so that's the sort of thing that we would look for. And after all, uh, that was a big part of uh, who I was when I was kicked out of the BC Liberal Party. I kept working on what we wanted to achieve, building up um, that coalition, within this province, inviting people to come over and join and be part of it. We kept moving people over, adjusting as we went uh, through, uh, and those values that, uh, that we brought forward with the election. And so uh, there is some room uh, in terms of some of the things that I think they would like that uh, we could potentially uh, work together on. Obviously, there's many things that we are in a disagreement with as well. A lot of people think that if you want to work in the mining industry, the NDP is having some destructive policies. Would you try and turn back things like short-term rental and the facility program, or are you just sort of waiting for them to set a direction and then people sort of don't want to stay with I think what you'll see from the Conservative Party is we will likely be bringing forward some private member bills, um, you know, pushing forward some of the things that we think need to be happening in British Columbia, uh, and looking for those opportunities to, put, to push the government uh, in the direction that uh, we've been campaigning on and wanting to see. And specifically on the SOGI, are you going to be pushing for parental involvement more than this Absolutely. Absolutely. Parents should know what's going on in our schools. Parents should have a right. It's their right to be able to raise their children. It's their right to know what's happening with their children in education. I think that's a very important piece uh, of, uh, of how our society operates. Um, and so, to what extent do you see yourself working with the NDP and finding any commonality on issues like housing and health care? Is there anything from their platforms on, on those issues that you connect with or see a path forward on? 
I mean, uh, if um, I will be pushing the NDP, particularly when it comes to housing, on actually getting the permitting process cleaned up so that we can see projects move forward. There are tens of thousands of housing starts in this province that are stalled out, that are not moving forward because it's taken too long, it's too costly. There are issues in terms of the building code that have added cost. So my hope is that through this election, maybe Dave Eby heard some of the concerns that the public has and we can find a way to be able to move forward those parts of the agenda that will actually help to get housing built in the province of British Columbia. Your intention was the foreign government falling short of that. What do you feel stood in the way of foreign government? Well, I think uh, uh, there's an old saying in politics that uh, you don't lose elections, you run out of time. And uh, the unfortunate part is that uh, we needed uh, perhaps some more time to be able to connect particularly with those, those people um, in the province that uh, may not have heard uh, the messaging and, and what we were trying to achieve in this province. So we'll be doing some analysis and work on that and looking at uh, what, what sort of issues were a barrier for, for people that did not vote for us uh, in light of uh, you know, the fact that there could be an election at any time going forward. Mary, Jeff? Uh, I just a quick question. I'm just wondering during the campaign, it was particularly divisive. I mean, um, there's name calling going on. Do you think that that's conducive to an uh, working environment because everyone is dealing with such a tight margin? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, all the way through the campaign, uh, David Eby, quite frankly, was a habitual liar about who we are, about what we did, about our platform. Uh, every day of the campaign, he was out saying these things. Uh, and I'm not going to say, oh, it, it's okay. That's who he is. That's his personality. Uh, I'll certainly be looking to call him out uh, in the legislature as we, as we move forward. However, elections are elections. This election's behind us. Uh, and uh, our job as the Conservative Party is to fight as hard as we can for the average everyday person in this province to try to improve their lives. And we'll be doing that uh, whether it's in opposition to government or trying to force government's hand to be able to make sure that things get done to help people. And just to follow up, just because there is such a, a slim margin, would you um, see an opportunity and take it perhaps as quickly as possible to take down the government? Um, if the David Eby has moves forward with the policies and approaches that he has done in British Columbia, uh, then yeah, we're going to be looking at uh, bringing it down as quickly as possible. Um, when you look at uh, what's happened in our society and the fact that after seven years you can't point to anything that is better in this province, um, you know, if he's going to carry on with that path, uh, I would have no choice but to oppose and uh, and make an attempt to bring it down, bring it to an end. So I think you're referring to a comment that uh, our candidate in, uh, um, in the uh, Malahat uh, made. I find uh, her comments uh, that she made quite offensive. Uh, certainly they're not part of uh, who I am or who we are as a party. And I can tell you that she will not be a candidate for this party going forward uh, should there be a snap election. Having said that, uh, obviously our working with First Nations is a huge priority. You cannot achieve anything, whether it's in the resource sector or otherwise in this province, unless you find a way to be able to work uh, with First Nations and to resolve particularly the issue of things like title. But what I find most curious uh, is uh, David Eby has not been held, held account to what he has done with First Nations. For example, we have seen the ex life expectancy of First Nations drop by six years under David Eby's government. And yet no outrage over that. I find that outrageous, that that is what has happened in such a short period of time. The fact that 20% of the people who have died from an overdose have been Indigenous, and no outrage over that. Uh, Alia Warbus called it a genocide um, on, on her people. And clearly, when you look at those statistics, that is shocking. And so I think, quite frankly, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, working with First Nations to resolve some of these issues. And I'm very surprised, actually, that First Nation leadership himself have not called out David E. before those failures. One follow-up, way back in 2018, um, you told me that you found opposition frustrating, that you hoped not to be in it for very long, and that you really, you know, weren't, weren't 
particularly happy being in an opposition role. I'm wondering if you feel differently now that you're leaving the official opposition and how you look at what lies ahead in the legislature. Absolutely agree with my comments before. Being in opposition is extremely frustrating because when you see what a government does, and particularly I'll use the forest example, uh, forest sector example again, when you see people losing their jobs, when you see mills closing down, when you see the damage to families and communities, and know that all you can do is point a finger and complain about it, that is frustrating. I'd much rather be in a situation where we can actually do the work that's necessary to support those jobs, support those families and communities. So, with you mentioned some of the comments that were. Um, uh... I have to do a lot of reading for my job, you know, emails, contracts, PDFs. To stay focused, I use a free Google Chrome extension. Revealed this weekend um, from the, the candidate for from Ally. Um, what, you know, is there, are you going to, have you spoken to uh, some of the MLALX about the messaging going forward, or is there anything that you're going to do to try to, you know, sort of. Uh, prevent that sort of sort of comments from from you know being made in the future. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, people uh, can say what they want to say. Uh, my perspective, though, is as the Conservative Party of British Columbia, we have values and we have standards uh, that we need to uphold for the people in this province and for who we represent. We also need to make sure that we recognize that we are a big team. And so, you know, for example, I talked very closely with Alia Warbus ab about those comments. Uh, and uh, about the sort of process and what had gone on. I know that Alia, as well as Chris Sankey, has talked to Marina uh, about the inappropriateness of those comments as well. Uh, and you've said over the past uh, week or so a couple times about um, you know, wanting to, to you know, bring down the government at the first opportunity. Uh, do you think people at BC have the appetite for another election right now? I don't believe they do, no. I don't believe they want to go to another election right away. Clearly, you know, we have had an election. Elections are very divisive. They're very expensive. Uh, they're very problematic. However, when I look at the damage that has been done by David Eby, if he's going to carry on with that path, then I would have no choice. Any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah, just, you, you talked earlier about the here in LA is being free to speak your mind. I just want to get clear on how far that extends. Uh, will the Conservative votes be whipped, or will they be free to vote their conscience on, on everything? There may be some issues that we do whip. Uh, however, uh, I would expect that uh, there will be other issues where people will be free to be able to vote their, their conscience. But those will be issues that we'll make sure that we talk about in our caucus um, amongst the uh, MLAs that are elected to make sure that people have a full understanding and where everything's at uh, and try to resolve any sort of issues that we might have. And just looking back on the campaign, uh, you know, uh, history always is 2020 vision. It's always you always can look back and think, you know, coulda, woulda, shouldas. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, for coming for the party that had no money, that had no team, that had no representatives, uh, and in a year and a half building it up to the place where we just fell short of forming government, um, you know, I'm pretty proud of what we've been able to accomplish. Uh, from Dan Burton, Vancouver for CBC. Where do you get the data that uh, latest expectancy for First Nations in BC has dropped? Uh, so we'll, we'll get that to you. Um, if, if you'd like, that was a piece of data that uh, I happened to notice uh, that came out. I think it was, uh, it was from the period of, t of 2017 through to 2021 um, or 2022. I can't remember exactly where it is, but I, I read the report, so I'm sure we can find that for you. Uh, questions? i got one more, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> now that uh, we're clear on what's happened, um, what, what's your assessment of the BC United capitulation surrender? How did that work out for you? Well, I think uh, you know Kevin Falcon recognized that uh, we needed to, um, to take the steps necessary to try to make sure we brought an end to what David E. B. Has, has done in this province and the damage of the NDP. Um, and so that's why he suspended the campaign and that's why he supported us. Uh, that message clearly didn't get through to everybody that was part of their group. Uh, there was a lot of people that were dissatisfied and wanted to carry on with, with the fight. Um, it's unfortunate. It would have been great if that could have happened three months earlier. That would have given us time to be able to do a, a bunch of things. Unfortunately, you know, it is what it is. But uh, like I say, you can go back and you can look at how things are done and, and wish it could have been done differently. But uh, I'm very proud of, like I say, of the team that we put together and what we've accomplished in such a short period of time. That will be all. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Where's your rule is one question, one follow-up, and one less lame. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you know what? If Les had another question, I would be happy to take a second follow-up. I've run out of gas. <laughs> <laughs> anyway.
Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thanks,